Hey, this is Austin Eckler, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Friday, August 4th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway. We are here. We're ready to talk top 10 wide receivers on today's show. Outstanding performance from Zach Wilson. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I tried to watch. Uh, I wanted to see all the Zach Wilson snaps. Sure. I wanted to see Israel a Oh, Come hold on, on hold Mike. On. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there, there just wasn't much to uh, much to see. I would say wasn't yes, particularly it's impressed. The Hall of Fame game. We're just more excited that football is back. Okay. That it exists. It's yeah. just a reminder. Yeah. It's like, remember this? Yes. Get ready. Someday it will look like this, but with players we care about. Yeah. Uh, happy to have you with us. Like I said, ultimatedraftkit.com. Head over there. Jam-packed. Every year it gets a little bit better. Uh, I believe, last I heard, over one Harry Potter novel's worth of analysis within the UDK in terms of written word. Interesting. Not in terms of spells. We didn't. Did we uh, shuffle the players into different houses? Not yet. That's a great <laughs> idea, Mike. Uh, it's a little different than tier based drafting. It's house based drafting. Uh, but no, it's uh, it's great. You got to check it out. UltimateDraftKit dot com. We do have a, a Voldemort, so that's true. We're, we're already on our way. Twitter uh, <laughs> X Brooks. You're gonna have to change the show docs. <laughs> Guess so. Uh, X gonna give it to you at the FF Ballers. Follow us over there. Follow Mike at FF Hitman. Follow Jason at Jason FFL. Follow me at Andy Holloway. And uh, quick question of the day: Alex in Indianapolis says, when a player is falling in a draft, how far past ADP before the value is too good to pass up? I love this question because I think it kind of it kind of pulls at the the whole ADP world in general of how you view and that's average draft position and so every platform has their own average draft position based on historical drafts that have taken place I was just in an underdog draft and I had this exact situation pop up and you know who fell um I'm trying to remember who it was uh I don't remember it off the top of my head it was Mm. like a name that just kept falling and kept falling, but I didn't need that position. Mm. And so um, I didn't take the player. Uh, There wasn't a number I was looking for. I mean, maybe we would have gotten to this point where I mess up my entire team strategy to take the player, but that wasn't the goal. Like if I took that player, I was going to be deficient someplace else. And so I would just say that like a couple things at the top, like I don't look at ADP like I'm missing out on something if I don't believe in that player and then ADP tells me I'm supposed to, that's one way I wouldn't, I wouldn't just take the player because they're falling. And the other way is if I've built the team a certain way and I'm going to disrupt that, like Jason, how do you approach it? Yeah. For for me, it's very different between whether this is like one of my leagues I'm in like the league of record or, or, you know, a startup, a redraft, um, or if I'm doing underdog drafts, cause an, an underdog drafts for me, there is a number. It's like if there if if he's about twenty spots behind ADP, I'm going to take him almost no matter what. Now, now your your example of like if if I've got th- three tight ends, I'm not going to grab a fourth one. Um, so there there's there's rules to that. But the reason that I would do that on underdog is because we're pretty good at fantasy football, and by we, I <laughs> I don't just mean the us three. I mean the humanity. Uh, average yeah. draft Just position. Clip that though. <laughs> average draft position 
it has, has proven, especially year, it, it gets better and better every single year, more and more accurate to the to the fantasy finishes of these players. So generally speaking, it is a good guide to where people's value would last. But um, you know, I try to diversify on underdog. If I've got a ton of drafts, I I want players sometimes that I that I don't like. You know, I, I want to sure. take a shot on them there. Whereas in my home league, it's like I, I that. I'm with Andy. I don't. I don't care so much about ADP. I want the guys that I believe in. The only place where it really changes for me is the middle round tight ends. Like I don't like drafting Hawkinson or Kittle or those guys. But if they do, you know, go a couple rounds later, then I'm I'm willing to pull that trigger. Sure. It the there is an inner battle uh, for everyone who plays fantasy football because you have your process, which has gotten you to the players that you believe in. And then watching someone fall, you know, in ADP, there's, you need to leave room, you need to have a margin of perhaps I am wrong. Perhaps my process on this player is wrong and there's a reason that they're being selected where they were, but in this draft they're falling. And then there is the emotional aspect of it, of drafting players because you feel like you're supposed to, that you don't believe in, and then they are bad. At the end of the year, oh, that feels bad. It feels really bad. Like this is this is not a this is not stat or scientifically based. This is this is the the human element of the game of the the emotional. Of, if I draft someone I knew I shouldn't have because they all of a sudden became a value, I will I never move away from it. Like I never forgive myself for drafting that player. And that that brings it to the point of like feeling pressure. To make the pick people think you're supposed to make. Exactly. So you don't look stupid. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And inherently, if a player is dropping that you don't believe in, like, they're not, they're dropping. Mm -hmm. So, like, other people aren't taking the player <laughs> you don't believe in. So it can be a bit of a uh, a mental hurdle to get over to, to kind of stick with your process. And ultimately... You don't want to live with that regret. I mean, Brooks mentioned it too. It's like if you take that player you didn't believe in because you feel like you have to so that it looks good as a name on your roster. It's the worst. Oh, I got a heck of a value on this guy I don't like. <laughs> that's it's, a, it's the worst. Yeah, that's and, and here's the other thing, and maybe it's a good August reminder now that we're into five days a week. None of the players in the NFL perform based on their average draft position in fantasy football. Mm-hmm. There is no direct correlation As to in performance. You're saying like they don't look at it. They don't look at it. They, they don't care about your fantasy team. No, nope, they don't get a little <laughs> ADP injection on the sidelines from the training staff that like helps them perform. It's at all the goal line, and the coach is like, "Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Get the backup in there. Yeah, I mean, we got to get him some more points." Here, here's a good example of an area where I am bucking some trends ADP wise. Carolina's wide receiver room. Okay. Uh, Adam Thielen, Jonathan Mingo are traditionally the two players, and Terrace Marshall, right? Those those names, they come up. I'm drafting DJ Chark above all those players. Okay. And because that, you know, we have this established average draft position that just comes out and then everybody just does it. But I think DJ Chark is a really talented player that is going to be able to earn opportunities there. And I don't really care what everybody else thinks about how that room's going to go. Now, I'm going to pay attention to preseason. I'm going to pay attention to camp and reality. But I'm not, you know, we, we get these average job positions going in February, March, April. Like, they, they kind of persist for a really long time. Uh, JSN, Tyler Lockett, that's been mm -hmm. an interesting ADP mm -hmm. thing to watch. Yeah, uh, that that one got pretty crazy pretty quickly um, because – you know, when when uh, something happens months ago and an ADP is quickly established, it's really hard for anyone staring at that to not just obey it. And so it, it <laughs> that's it's obey the ADP. And so it just kind of sticks. And when things change, they, they don't catch up quick enough. So as we get closer and closer to the end of August to your actual draft, be willing to know that if if new information has happened and changed, recently over the last couple of weeks ADP will not reflect it as well as it should so be a little bit more aggressive there oh because it's lagging yeah 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 and if you drafted JSN and around behind ADP three months ago you're like oh man I, I took the value I wanted 
and then now he's behind Tyler Lockett in mm-hmm. drafts. So it's not a value anymore. So, yeah, it is it is an interesting discussion as a whole because I think the, the overarching thing is there's a lot of pressure when you're in those drafts because every time you click below, like if you're on a platform, ESPN, Yahoo, whatever, Sleeper, and you see that list and you take a player three or four below, like you feel like you did something wrong. Yes. Yes. And, and you know, if, even we, even we feel that way. And like our Our job is to talk about fantasy football. And I still feel the pressure of an online draft room and the guy who's at the top of the ADP. I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the guy, it's the best guy left, right? <laughs> Which has to be. You could take advantage of that in the yes. fact that the other people in your league are going to feel a lot of pressure yeah. to take those top guys. You got to fight against it. But um, it's hard because you also pick and then you wait maybe 15 picks before you pick again. So um, good question. Thank you, Alex, for sending that one in. Let's jump into the news. News and notes from around the league. Presented by USAA Insurance. Well, we got some news from the Seattle running back room. Zach Charbonnet. Cobbler strikes again. Peach Cobbler with the unknown injury for Zach Charbonnet. He's back. He's back on Thursday in In, practice. Indefinite (laughs) means whatever you want it to mean. Look, we got to figure out this word indefinite because it is ominous. And and terrifying. And yes, Pete Carroll used it. Technically, it was appropriate. Like the Lasting def- for an unknown or unstated length yes. of time. Yes. But usually when you say that, mm-hmm. you're like, this guy's going to miss some time. I just don't know how much. You're not like, if someone's going to miss three days, you go, yeah, he'll be out a couple of days. I, I would use only that word. If, <laughs> oh, I, if I was a head coach, I would never use another word. <laughs> Yeah, you, you you're not accountable to that word, and you're not even like as a coach, you don't know. It's the training staff, so like, I would like uh, mid game, like when they're trying to talk to you. Oh, we saw we saw your center got a little shook up there. How long how, is he gonna miss time? Indefinite. <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah. just don't know. Next snap, they're back. Well, that's, that's a good. I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know. I mean, a coach could get away with that. Well, but yeah, because they. Do, I mean, you don't actually know. So I, maybe I, indefinite does sound more ominous than just saying like. I'm not sure when he'll be back. I hope he's back soon. Like, if you say that, it is saying the same thing because you hope they're back soon. We have a follow-up quote from Pete Carroll on Zach Charbonnet. He said, quote, so now we know what indefinitely is. He said that? What? Yes. Freaking Pete Carroll. Oh, he's with us. Gosh darn it. Oh, he's he's a clever. <laughs> he's a sneaky snook. Yeah, he really is. Uh, Kenneth Walker didn't practice groin injury, but they're not concerned about that injury. According, according to the team, they said he'll, you know, he'll be back. Elijah Mitchell out of practice with another injury. Man, um, his punch card for the year of injuries starting Which, to get it filled. The, the the 49ers backup situation is something that needs to be monitored. You would have presumed it was Elijah Mitchell because it has been him before the Christian McCaffrey thing, but Elijah Mitchell can't seem to stay on the field. We've seen uh, last year's third round pick Ty Davis Price getting some run with the ones. But I've also seen some beat reporters that I I trust saying that Jordan Mason looks like he would be the next man up currently if Christian McCaffrey were to miss time. And uh, let's go here. (laughs) Broncos head coach Sean Payton said Javante Williams is going to play in the preseason. This is insanity. It's great. It oh it if Javante Williams is truly healthy, this is it's fantastic news. Incredible talent. We, it, it it's still even if he's getting snaps in the preseason, you still don't know what his what his workload is going to be. Like, how soon will he be truly the guy? Like, will he ever be a workhorse? I we just we don't know that. So this actually, while this is great news for Javante Williams, the player, the man, the the truthers, the Javante Williams truthers, it makes the situation. All the more messy, where it felt like you could get some Ajay P. Ryan, who's a good player, at a decent value in the draft, and fill in for two to four weeks while I'm trying to figure out some things up in the running back position. Now, who knows if that's true? I mean, what are you what are you guys doing with this information? Are you uh, like are you moving your risk down on Javante? Are you moving him up? What have you how how have you reacted? I I have been continuing to watch and monitor the situation, and I want to be aggressive to jump in okay. if this just continues progressing. I think it'll get me a discount on P. Ryan, who I think will be very valuable throughout the 
the okay. whole year. So um, Javante, I don't think is going to be like I think Samaj P. Ryan's good. Yeah. So uh, in that regard, like Javante, we have, you know, we were waiting last year to have that big opportunity. Um, only got to see him for what three and a half games. It was just a few. And uh, I'm excited to see what both of those guys can do in the backfield. It's really great news for Javante to get out on the field, get this work through, and maybe he's a second-half league winner. That was today's News and Notes presented by USAA Insurance. Learn more at usaa.com slash insurance. Wide receivers. Well, if you missed it, yesterday we started the wide receiver rankings countdown. Went from 20 to 11. There were a whole bunch of wide receiver twos, talented wide receiver twos out there that we talked through. You can listen to that show. Today we start with the number 10 overall receiver in our rankings being drafted as the wide receiver 10. Okay. We all have him ranked very closely. Jason at 9, Mike and I at 11. is uh, He's a late second-round draft pick. It is sophomore Garrett Wilson. Last year, you got to see it on display against all odds. Um, really productive rookie season. Rookie of the year, right? Offensive rookie? That's right. 83 for 1,104. Well, really productive half a season. Yeah, I mean, he busted in 47% of games despite the output being at that level. And those, and those games, those 47%, we call those the <laughs> Zach Wilson games. Yeah, I mean, it's a big well, transformation and change just for him statistically this year. Speaking. <laughs> right, right. Just, yeah, just, you know, because of the math. <laughs> so, um, where are you with, with Garrett Wilson ceiling with Aaron Rodgers? Is it a breakout 1,500 yard season? Is that in the cards for Garrett Wilson? The, yeah, it, it is. I mean, that's the ceiling. The ceiling is, you know, 10 touchdowns, 1,500 yards, it's, a true breakout, a like superstar. It's a top three guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about, I think, Andy, you brought up um, a couple weeks ago that you believe he has the ability <clears throat> to finish as the number one overall wide receiver. With Aaron Rodgers, if he were to get 12, 13 touchdowns, that, that, that could be in the cards. And if you look what he did rookie year, you know, the jokes about Zach Wilson, he scored 6.7 fantasy points per game with Zach Wilson. 14.2 without Zach Wilson. Now he gets Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, 23 years old, right at that prime age for a huge breakout. We'll have every opportunity in this offense is the most explosive, the most athletic. Camp has been great. And, um, you know, the price is pretty high for Garrett Wilson. It's 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 Pretty well baked in, but the yes. ceiling could be higher than where he's being drafted. So I don't personally have a problem with it. Starts the season against Buffalo, Dallas, New England, Kansas City, Aye. Denver, Philly. Who? So we've talked about the oh. Jets start to the season. <laughs> That's suboptimal. And, um, you know, you're going to see what this team has right away with the Jets. So uh, anything to add on Mr. Wilson? Uh, He's really good. Yes, he is a tremendous player. I like. We're all in. I mean, the the fantasy football community at large is in on Garrett Wilson. The ADP is a little scary because you're you know you're you're basically all but guaranteeing that the breakout is going to happen. But all the all the background stuff for Garrett Wilson with the perceived upgrade of Aaron Rodgers you know I, I kind of tongue-in-cheek brought up well what if Aaron Rodgers is like what if this is another situation of the Denver Broncos happening we don't think that's the case but it's like there's there's definitely some some risk with Garrett Wilson but he it, it's exactly the profile that you want to bet on because you want the upside of if Garrett Wilson hits top three is in the range of outcomes yeah, I mean, he's he's the number one on this team that is clear and evident, and uh, I have no problem with him at that draft price. Where, like, uh, the the next player we have ranked higher, clearly, because it's number nine, um, so I'll just move it along, but it's Amon Ross St. Brown for the Detroit Lions. But when you're looking at these two, you know, talking about the risk of Garrett Wilson, Amon Ra finishing in the top three would be pretty surprising to me. Yeah. Like, Amon Ra is sensational. We have him ranked very high. But just saying, you know, the risk of of drafting 
a more a, a a player who is slightly more proven in Amon Ra versus slightly unproven for Garrett Wilson. But the you want ceiling. If it was a uh, full point per reception, I could be talked into Amon Ra above Garrett Wilson. I have him one spot below. You guys both have him higher. But certainly in half and standard leagues, I want Garrett Wilson. I want the touchdown upside. We've seen – like that's something that Aaron Rodgers has always been able to do is is provide high touchdown totals for his number one receiver. You know, Devontae Adams, it was an automatic situation. Uh, he's given the keys to the red zone a lot of the time. Aaron Rodgers is efficient down there, effective. I think Garrett Wilson is a much higher upside play than Amon Ra, but agreed. But Amon Ra is going to be an automatic producer for your roster. So let's turn there. Being drafted one spot higher at wide receiver nine on average. Uh, like I said, you guys are both a little bit higher on him than Garrett Wilson, and he is tied for the most receptions, one ninety six through the first two years of his career with Michael Thomas and Justin Jefferson. So this is a a very you know if you listen to interviews with him or you you watch training camp video like this is a very driven individual to be great i think there were 20 wideouts taken ahead of him. how many wideouts were <laughs> I taken don't ahead of yeah, him yeah where he can list them all off I mean, the top of his head he has had a persistent chip on his shoulder as a wide receiver since he came into the league and and this team has a lot of weapons so and we're not going to see Jamison Williams for a while Marvin Jones is older Sam LaPorte is a rookie Jameer Gibbs is out of the backfield like I don't see how it goes wrong for Amon Ra outside of injury. No, it, it, it that's the thing about Amon Ra is he is as safe as it comes. It, in half PPR scoring, he was the wide receiver eight last year, and he scored six touchdowns. That's, right. That's, that's, I mean, he could absolutely score a ton more. He, he had 106 receptions and only six touchdowns, finishes a top 10 wide receiver. The offense now, you've got another you know year with Goff and – Everything is, you know, full steam ahead for him. I would agree that the, you know, the the area that he lacks is the downfield stuff, right? So you fifteen hundred yards, that's not going to happen for a player like that who's a possession receiver. So you're right, he's better in full PPR. If I'm staring down those two guys on the clock, I mean, I've got Amon Ra at my wide receiver seven. My stats have him finishing the season better than Garrett Wilson. I think that the odds are that he will finish higher than Garrett Wilson, but the conversation is definitely which one has the higher ceiling, and that's if you're in the ultimate draft kit, pay attention to the upside meter that we have there, because that is the difference there. I would probably still take Garrett Wilson ahead for the shot of superstardom. Yeah, and just to highlight that a little bit more, so Amon Ra, you know that the season opened very well, wide receiver 14, wide receiver 3, gets banged up, okay, you know, it kind of in and out of the lineup, getting low snaps, low opportunities. Once he was back and healthy, that's week eight. So from week eight through the rest of the season, in actual total points, he was the wide receiver six in that span. And yet, in that time period, on a weekly finish, he was in the top ten three times. And every other game, he was outside of the top 20. Now this is – it's – it's not bad because in those weeks you're just saying that some spike weeks are happening for other players. He's just he's very consistent. It's it's a lot like Keenan Allen. It is a lot like Keenan where Allen. it's just he is a true. It depends on how you play. Like he's he a is, chain mover. He's he's a chain mover. He's a he's a stable piece to your 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 fantasy football team through because you know the yards will be there. You know the receptions will be there. But overall, he's not going to be jumping into the top five on a weekly finish as much as these other players. Yeah, and we did, we did talk about a little bit of uh, positive regression potential inside the red zone for this team through the air right? If because you'd... of you know Jamal's touchdowns. And, yes. and so you could hope, but these type of players like Keenan, you, you kind of peak at maybe an eight-touchdown year. You sit around four or five every year, and then you soak up PPR points, and uh, Amon Ra is that type of guy. Quick break, back with number eight. All right, at number eight, we have a 24-year-old wide receiver being drafted as the wide receiver seven. We've got him at eight. Mike's the highest at six. I, I'm at eight. Jason's at 10. And that would be CeeDee Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys. 
The breakout finally happened last year. Wide receiver six overall was fourth in reception and targets, led the league in slot receiving yards, and from week eight on, he was the wide receiver two in fantasy points per game. So uh, we've we've seen it with an offensive coordinator we trust. Mm -hmm. Now we have to trust C.D. Lamb to do it in spite of maybe a a slight change in offense because uh, Dak has been turnover prone uh, also in training camp from what I hear. Yeah, I'm and, not worried uh, about that, honestly. I'm worried about it when it comes on the heels of, of the amount of interceptions oh, so he's the, thrown. But just, just a quick aside. Um, like, mistakes are supposed to happen in training camp. So I'm, uh, this is just like I'm talking about quarterbacks throwing interceptions. Don't freak out. I, I don't blame Andy. I don't blame you of like Dak was struggling with that the last couple of years. And if you're like, oh, well, the struggles continue. But don't overlook into interceptions during practice. Like the quarterbacks are encouraged. Make these throws. Like just try it. See what happens because you want to know what's going to work here as opposed to figuring it out if it's going to work during a game. Yeah. And uh, I know that this offense part of the, the transition, Kellen Moore leaving. Mike McCarthy and company, Brian Schottenheimer taking over, is to put them in a, a position to uh, protect the football. Score their, less. Their defense is strong. And, uh, well, I, it's tough. It is tough. I mean, he was on pace for, you know, over the last 10 games, 24 interceptions on the year. That's that's a huge problem. Happened in the playoffs what as was, well. What was Dak's injury? Dak hurt himself. It wasn't in his hand? It was a thumb. It was a, Yeah, so yeah. – I I don't know if that factored in or not, but the guy did break his thumb. Like, was that his? Was it his throwing hand on his right thumb? Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe that factored in. Um. Yeah. So the the team is transitioning. C.D. Lamb will he have the same opportunity to put up this kind of a season? So the the opportunity is the scary part for me. He has the same talent. He's ex an exceptional wide receiver, and he's got the same quarterback. So you you've got a lot of safe uh, qualities here. But the opportunity is what's scary because last year you had Michael Gallup who wasn't fully, you know, he he wasn't all the way back um, to full health. And you had the departure of Amari Cooper. You had Kellen Moore with a fast pace of play. And I don't think that the uh, I don't think that the offensive coordinator shift is going to make them run the ball even more. They they ran so much, but I think it will slow them down. I think they will pace of play. Pace of play will will slow down. Total offensive snaps will go down as they want to rest the defense and and you know play old school football a little bit. Not so much uh, that we're only going to run, but then you add Brandon Cooks in, and there's just a little bit more competition for targets and a little slower pace of play. That's why I've got him at wide receiver ten. I mean, I'm still in on CD Lamb. I don't think he has a bad year by any stretch but I think it is not as good as last year when he was the wide receiver and, six. and I think it's important to say this right now because we're counting down the top 10 wide receivers so when you hear us say something negative it's because we're trying to find a way to differentiate between these players these are all players we think are great they wouldn't be in the top 10 if if they weren't so it's like we're not going to come on the show and be like number eight CeeDee Lamb He's awesome. All right, number seven. He's <laughs> awesome too. We're looking at some some ways to differentiate and give you uh, information to make an informed decision in your draft. And so, I think CD Lamb's a great player. He's twenty four years old. I think he's a pretty automatic pick. I think he's a pretty great, um, like consistent option for your team. But there are variables in play for CD Lamb that weren't there last year and. And so we need to see what happens there. I'm not particular myself. I'm not particularly concerned about Brandon Cooks or Michael Gallup in the offense. You have so many abandoned targets that Dalton Schultz had in the offense last year. But those are good points. I mean, they, they are going to be a slower offense. They have a great defense. They were number one in turnovers forced last year. Um, they can win a lot of ball games that way. And so, uh, you know, is this a situation where you're going to see maybe – less production in the second half of games if they have a lead that they've gotten in the first. We talked about it with Philly. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what you see in this offense. Maybe they're not uh, stretching the field as much in the second half and they're just on the ground. Something I, I don't know that I've 
really thought about because the off season narrative has been very fun. <clears throat> that the Mike McCarthy has provided with the soundbite of saying that they were score essentially saying we're scoring too much. We need to run the ball more and let the defense rest. Which that's it, it's fun to to talk about that. Will they really be able to do that? Now the offensive line is it's not what it was like. It's still it. I think it'll still be one of the stronger units in the in the league. But looking at the running back room, right? Tony Pollard's the guy. Mm -hmm. Tony Pollard's about uh, two fifteen. Is it? Did he get up to two fifteen? Yeah, I think. Okay. He, I'm pretty sure he's two fifteen. So he's he's at about two fifteen. Uh, we know that Ronald Jones is facing uh, facing a two game suspension if he even makes the team. And Ronald Jones is a smaller guy. Malik Davis. Malik Davis is barely over two hundred pounds. Deuce Vaughn is barely over one hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I'm joking, but. Like the, but also kind of true. The size of these players that they have – that the Cowboys said that and then they're moving forward. Like this is this is a smaller running back room. This is not the the type – this is not the archetype of player like Zeke where like we can give him the ball on the ground 20-plus times a game and we know that he's not going to wear down. Like can they actually do that with anybody on this team? I don't know. I don't. I it it surprises me too because you would expect another bruiser to be added to this backfield and it hasn't happened. So, um, something to watch with Dallas at number seven, Devontae Adams. Yeah, thirty years old, second round draft pick, being drafted as the wide receiver eight. I have him at five. Jason at eight. Mike at eight. Last year he was the wide receiver three. Uh, he led the NFL in percentage of first read targets which is a new stat from Fantasy Points that I've really enjoyed looking at. Um, you know, he's been top three in fantasy for three of the past four years. Obviously, last year it was with Derek Carr and previously with Aaron Rodgers. Um, I don't know if I can make him a my guy because of where he's being drafted. Absolutely yeah. you yeah. can. But I am strongly considering it. Oh, hey, look, we make the rules. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this. But we make. What the are the official my guy rules? We make the rules for this show. It's in consideration, okay? Because I think he's being. I think this is the a, a crazy opportunity to go running back in the first round and maybe draft the best wide receiver in the second round. Like I'm not saying Adams is, is going to be number one, but he's got as good a chance as anybody to be in the top three, in my opinion. Obviously Jefferson is there, but if you know if Adams outperformed Chase, wouldn't be surprised. If Adams outperformed Tyreek, wouldn't be surprised. So that possibility being drafted at wide receiver eight, I am very bullish. Um, you guys have him at eight where he's being drafted. So you are with the the rest of the earth yeah, on I'm, that one. I'm totally with you on Which has to be just Jimmy G. Yeah, that is where mm -hmm. I was gonna go. I'm I'm in lockstep with you on the opinion of Devontae Adams, the player. I don't think that he has lost anything. It was you know, it it was a great season, but you did have Certainly some games where you're like, what the heck is going on? Why can't Devontae Adams catch a target here? But Jimmy Garoppolo has, in his career, been a, I need yards after catch. Like, this is this is how my wide receivers produce. This, this is what he did in San Francisco. It's, you know, quick where, uh, quick uh, passes close to the line of scrimmage, let my wide receivers work. If that shift happens, can Devontae Adams still get it done? Uh, as where last year with Derek Carr, this was like this was a head like big big a dots average depth of target for Devontae Adams. He was the, his yards his, per catch were the highest of his career, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah, that's how, that's by true. a wide margin. Yes, and he was a touchdown machine as well. So that's my concerns are all related to Jimmy Garoppolo. Mixing in, is he going to mesh with what Devonte Adams needs? Let me let me put this in your brain as one area where he may overcome an A dot issue, and see if you agree. Air, uh, his career catch percentage is sixty six percent. From the time he became an elite player with Aaron Rodgers, his catch percentage was sixty eight percent. Last year, he had one hundred and eighty targets. Yes, in that offense. Which look, you're not going to have as high a catch percentage when your average depth of tar target is deep. He caught 100 passes out of 180. That was like 56%. If he's getting the ball closer to the line of scrimmage and he's getting 180 targets, 
the PPR numbers are going to make up for some of that A dot. So I think that you're going to end up in three to five with him. Um, I just don't fear Jimmy Garoppolo in contrast to Derek Carr that much. I would agree with you in general. There, he, he's not. It's not going from greatness to terribleness. Um, it, you know, it's they're they're near each other. The one concern I have is touchdowns. It you know it's like fourteen a, last year. Exactly. He had he had you know fourteen touchdowns, and I I do think that that is different when you get in the red zone. The red zone work. I would trust Eric Carr more than I would trust Jimmy Garoppolo. But double digits six of seven years. Devontae is, Adams the is fantastic. Is awesome, and he is loud. He will demand targets. He will have. 160 targets. So if you've got talent and you've got opportunity, that's great for fantasy football. He's not costing what he usually costs, which is a first round pick. So I, I think there is value here, but I, I would be surprised if he finishes inside the top five, just because I don't expect him to keep the double digit touchdown streak going. So Kyle just shared the stat with us that nine of the fourteen touchdowns for Devontae Adams were twenty plus yards or or more for a, yeah. like that's a so many bombs. That's a that's a monster score. Where can Jimmy Garoppolo do that? Is I know the NFL the, the Raiders are betting on it at least they're betting that Jimmy Garoppolo is a good starting quarterback. Is he like he was playing with Kyle Shanahan, who basically every quarterback except for Trey Lance that we see start for Kyle Shanahan. They just they're very adequate. Like the offense does it as long as the as long as the quarterback doesn't screw up, the offense will take care of itself. Where I don't think that's the offense isn't going to take care of it for him with the Raiders. Jimmy Garoppolo is going to have to carry. Can he do it? I don't know. Yeah, we're going to find out. I think I'm on the side of yes. Sure. And I understand doubting Jimmy G. No question. Number six, A. J. Brown, Eagles wide receiver. The wide receiver, six in ADP right now. Top of the second round. We all of them ranked the same. And um, last year, it was massive volume. Uh, he had 146 targets. That was a career high for him. Uh, the previous years had been 84, 106, 105. Uh, he's dealing with Devonta Smith on the other side, who had 136 targets himself. Dallas Goddard uh, on and off the field last year. But, you know, A.J. Brown is a force. He's a physical uh, dominator. You can throw the ball up to him. You can throw those uh, sideline, you know, almost jump balls that he ends up winning. Uh, there were so many times last year, and I know because I saw the look on Jason's face, where that ball went up and you just knew what was going to happen. Uh, A.J. Brown is just bigger than you, stronger than you, faster than you, and uh, that's been the case. So, you know, where does it go right? Where does it go wrong for A.J. Brown this year? We got him at six. We obviously think it's going to go pretty well. Yeah, it's going to go great. <laughs> I mean, this, just, this is a guy who his first two years in the league was a top 15 wide receiver for fantasy while averaging fewer than 100 targets. And now he's in a position where he's getting 140-plus targets. He's just too good. He's in his prime. He's got a great quarterback. So how does it go wrong? Injuries. That's end, just, of, like, end of case. He caught ten of Jalen Hurts' twenty-two passing touchdowns. So you know, could he could he lose a couple of those? I think, yeah. Sure. I mean, that could happen. Goddard or Devonta Smith variables, but yeah, it, it's going to be a really smooth ride for AJ Brown this year, outside of injury. And, and the nice thing is, with those targets, what we saw for you know, not you know, probably the first time in his career was consistency he's always been a high upside big you know he can go and finish as the wide receiver one for a week and dominate down the field but now you know over his last 17 games we have him scored at with a, an a in consistency 76.5 percent of his games above that threshold of good games that is much higher than even Devonte adams with 180 targets so i really don't see how it goes wrong outside of injury. I'm I'm very confident drafting AJ Brown. Uh, I believe that he is as close to a lock to be a top ten wide receiver as you could possibly be. Um, and you know, if you say could he be the wide receiver one overall? Yeah, he's got the talent. He's yeah, got he the scores skill. fifteen times. He will be. Yeah, 
That's what I mean. That that'll happen. And then when we're we're splitting hairs with these wide receivers, it's not a terrible thing to look at the first four games just to see what's going on with their schedule. AJ Brown will be playing at the Patriots, but then he will play, be playing the Minnesota Vikings at Tampa Bay and Washington. That's three juicy matchups. And then just just to highlight the, to compare to Devontae Adams, who will be playing at Denver, at Buffalo, Pittsburgh, at the Chargers. So it, Devontae Adams could be a – he could be a buy low by week three. Yeah, but you know what you just showed me? You showed me that they – once again, the Eagles that first month, they don't get second <laughs> halves. They don't get to Fair. throw the they ball. They don't the need se second halves. I know. I mean, it was good last but year without second them. halves. I, you, I, you want a title with first halves. That's all. We don't need you to get a second half. Mm. Uh, number five is a player that, that, that A.J. Brown has entered this category, which is uh, elite quarterback combined with elite production over time means they're automatic. And Stephon Diggs is in that category right now. Comes in at number five. I have him at six. Jason and Mike at five. Being drafted at the end of the first round. He's played three seasons now with the Bills. There is so much consistency in this offense. Head coach, quarterback, you know, Josh Stallion himself. Season averages with Buffalo, 161. That's the targets. 112 receptions, 1,396 yards, and 9.7 touchdowns. So, um, yes, please. Yeah, you, you just kind of don't pass on digs because of his tweets. Well, okay. Like, maybe there's more answers to this <laughs> at uh, this Mad Lib. Don't pass on Stephon Diggs because he keeps doing it. Mm -hmm. That is something that happens in fantasy. You take the sexier name of the unknown whoever. Don't pass on Diggs just because it's kind of like his elite play has become routine. Yeah, you're looking at Garrett Wilson. You're like, what, exactly. if, what if he's Stephon Diggs? Exactly. <laughs> no, Stephon Diggs is still. He's already Diggs. He's still there. He still will be him. For he is him. he is him he is him for at least one more year. Yeah, it's like Garrett Wilson. Can he get to fifteen hundred yeah. yards? Oh, that'd be awesome! And it's like Dig, uh, Diggs, Diggs is sitting over there yeah. going like I had fifteen hundred thirty five yards. I do it every year. I, I had fourteen hundred and twenty nine yards. Yeah. I, so yeah, I mean he's and the competition target wise is is not impressive. Like it's we hope James Cook is good. We hope Dalton Kincaid is good. We hope what Gabe, about Gabe, Gabe the, the Babe. We hope Gabe the Babe is that's a nickname. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's there, it's Brooks. Not, it's not Brooks good. did it. No, it doesn't. Are our nicknames good, Mike? Yeah, I stand behind most of them. The dump truck. Oh, oh that that's is great. That's that's top tier. That was a great. Nickname. And I got to give credit where it's due. That was Kyle. Uh, yeah. Now I, how I, do you I, feel I about it? Dave, you mean but... blame? You got to give blame. <laughs> no credit. <laughs> so he, you don't want the tweets. Gabe the babe. All the offensive weapons, Khalil Shakir and other players, they are all projected. We hope they're okay. But when push comes to shove, Diggs will be the guy. So. And what's really cool is he was very upset with his targets last year. It's ridiculous. He like, had 154 targets, and he was like, "He saw Adams I, with 180." Yeah, and he's like, "I'm not coming. To, I'm not showing up for first day of of camp. I'm going to send a message because I'm unhappy with my role in the offense. Your role is <laughs> as a superstar." Stephon Diggs was out indefinitely. That's true. At That's that true. time, they didn't know. I, it was one day. <laughs> when, when you hear him complaining for a team that he's that good with that good of a quarterback, like he's got the dream scenario for any wide receiver in football. Paid well, mm -hmm. great quarterback, clear number one, piles of targets, still unhappy. Don't understand it, but it's just a – it's like one of those wide receivers. Stay hungry. Like someday they'll look at the DNA of wide receivers <laughs> under a microscope and they'll find that gene that just gets mad at things. It's discontent. Yeah. But I do love – at wide receiver, I love a squeaky wheel. I mean, I sure. love it. That's why Adams will not have fewer than 175 targets. Yeah, because if he he'll, he'll punch another photographer. <laughs> ran into, ran into. Okay, Tyreek Hill comes in at number four. I've got him at two. He's my second okay. favorite wide receiver in fantasy this season. You guys have him at four, which is where he's being drafted. Um, he's been a top six fantasy wide receiver in five of six years. He is the definition of you get it all. It's not Amon Ra where you get the PPR and not the touchdowns and not the big plays. It's not, you know, uh, even what you got with uh, Devontae Adams last year. It was like, oh, it's a two-touchdown game and big plays, and then where was he in the second half? Like Tyreek Hill is, um, like, it's programmed into Tua's brain. He goes back. It's Tyreek first read and also Tyreek last read. Because when the play breaks down, Tyreek is somehow 
15 yards away from anybody else down the field. I rewatched the six touchdowns in that Baltimore game, the big comeback. Right. Tyreek Hill is so far away from people in these plays that it doesn't seem fair. Like, like Tua can't even throw far enough to get to him? Well, no, just that his separation from the defenders is laughable. It's like you're watching a flag football game for your kids where they forgot one kid was back behind there and they just run wild and free. Um, you know, he, he's a monster. Like I said earlier in the show, highest targets, highest receptions of his career, or sorry, highest yards and receptions of his career. 31% targets per route run last year for Tyreek Hill. He did all of that. Set those numbers with Tua being injured at times. So, you know, yeah, it's not it hard be to say good things about the top four wide receivers. It's just that there were really only, other than the, the final week of the year, week 18, which you weren't playing him, there was really one game, one, the entire year that he actually hurt you at all. The rest of them, it was like, I mean, he finished number four at the position five different weeks, number two at the position two different weeks. It was it was a really good year for Tyreek Hill. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was. 12% if you, bust. If you're going to say <clears throat> anything bad, it's ironic, some of his – best games were as far as targets like the, the you know you talk about he had those times where he finished as the number four uh overall wide receiver two of those games were without Tua when the backup came in uh those were really bad Jalen Waddle games and ex and you just threw the ball 15 targets 14 targets to Tyreek Hill because I mean if I'm coming in <laughs> yeah 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 I know what I'm doing I'm going where's that dude that's wide open and faster than everyone but it's not like he had bad games with Tua. He had good games the whole season. Um, I do think his I, – I wonder if Tua is there for all 17 games, if that is – it's great for Tyreek Hill, but I wonder if that's almost his – maybe not his peak just because it's better for Waddle as the ball might get spread around a little bit from a quality quarterback. But uh, you, there's no complaints. You, you can't stop him. He's too fast. Really nice um, opportunity, at least in week one, against the Chargers. Cooper Cup, Mike, he sits at three right now. Uh, I got him at four, Mike, and Jason at three. Yeah, and it is, unfortunately, a little bit scary uh, as if you're just tuning back into fantasy. Yeah, if you're just tuning back into fantasy football and getting ready, Cooper Cup has a hamstring injury. He injured it in training camp. They're calling him day to day. The quote is he'll be back in the right time and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I mean, I don't know what Mike LaFleur is doing here. Just, just say indefinite. And, yeah, and you're, yeah, taken care of. We got a word to describe what you're saying. Yeah, we we don't know when he will, he will be back. Hamstring injuries that shut players down in training camp historically are are very scary. It's so hard when the upside is so it, insanely. High. The upside is the overall number one player. Like yeah. Cooper, Cooper Cup had not lost it, despite what the Rams were doing last year. Like it was a bad product on the field. They were not a good team. Cooper Cup was still by far dominating. He was the number one wide receiver in points per game over Justin Jefferson yep. by a by a few points mm -hmm. before he got hurt. That's that was the separation. That's the upside. Let me test. But, but you -hoo. he was he was and just, just sorry. I just want you to know the pace that he was on because we're talking about all these numbers with all these great wide receivers, right? There's, uh, it's hard to find complaints. The pace he was on last year before he got injured. Um, guess his reception pace. Let's go one hundred and sixty. One hundred and fifty three receptions. Okay. Right. Seventeen hundred yards and twelve point eight touchdowns. I mean, just. The best of the best. He um, finished in the top 24, and he played nine games. Let me played test like you. eight games. Let me test hamstring worries. Okay. You're drafting today. Yeah. You're staring down other running backs where you had been drafting Cooper Cup. <sighs> Eckler Cup. Uh, mm. Oh, man. Mm. I think I still take Cooper. <sighs> I'm drafting no, I, today. I'm taking Eckler. I'm drafting today. I think Why I, the risk when you get Eckler? I think I go Eckler. Eckler's worth it. Kelsey. No. You're not going Kelsey over Cup? No. I'd be willing to do that. Mike? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess I need I need to move Tyreek Hill above him because I would take Tyreek. Bijan? 
Cup. I w- that that's the break for me. That's where I, I wait. Would- how could you not take Eckler over Cup? Or you did? I did. He did. Oh, okay. he did. You I did. said I was. Okay, I, sorry, but I, sorry. I have Eckler just a few spots lower than you guys. Bijan. Uh, I think I still take Cooper Cup. Diggs. That's a that's question. a that's a really tough one. I mean, based I, on rankings yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. you would. But but if you if push came to shove and you're staring that down risk wise, it's scary. It is. I think I think I would take Stephon Diggs over him. Don't draft till Man. later. Oh, people. Jamar Chase at number two. Also known as Mike's number one overall wide receiver Ooh, which right I now. I just found out this morning. I was unaware he's, that he was your number one. And he's been there for a long time. I love it. Okay. Jason, you have him at two. I got him at three. Last year, missed some time. He's a superstar. He is. He is a superstar. And the reason I have him number one, I think there was uh, a lot of meat left on the bone there for, uh, for Jamar Chase. I mean, the the fact that he jumped from 81 receptions in 17 games as a rookie, uh, he had 87 catches in just 12 appearances last year. Like, he was he was already being used more, right? Like, you saw the target share jump from 24% up to 29%. 29%, that's an elite level target share. If you're right around that 20%, 30%, like, you're, you're going to be incredible when you combine the talent of Jamar Chase and then you also had the uh like kind of the strange anomaly of the the yards per catch dipped from 18 down to 12 I don't think he's going I think 18's kind of an outlier but 12 seems too low to me for Jamar Chase perhaps it's a product of just the way that the NFL defenses are are shifting to that it's shell It's also the the quantity of of receptions that you liked about him you know that's naturally going to happen, right? But I think that twelve is too low. Oh, I, th- I think that's that, true. I think he can see that target pace and still be up in the thirteen to fourteen. Yeah, range. he could be a fifteen like Devontae Adams who had right. one hundred and eighty targets and still ended up at fifteen. Uh, what about those bus games though, Mike? Uh, he's sitting at zero percent. I... Concerning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how that's possible. Twelve that, games, no bus. Wow. That seems impossible for a wide receiver. All wide receivers have bad games, but Jamar Chase is too good. And when you get thirty percent of targets coming from Joe Burrow, they're 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 great targets. They're on point. They're leading you ahead of defenders. Uh, his pace last year was a hundred and ninety targets. I mean, that, that's not what you thought of Jamar Chase beforehand. And I don't. I absolutely do not believe. I don't. I don't, I don't I believe. Don't, I don't believe, Daddy. I no. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is what, the what is that? I don't, <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't know it's what like it is, Scottish. man. It just sounds funny. Um, th- I do not believe at all that we have seen Jamar Chase's best season. Like, there's no way in his career. Yeah, I agree. Right now, and you know he's well, he's me, 23 years old. Let, we haven't let me seen share his something. best yet. Yeah, and and let me share you upside. Okay. And and the difference. You need to understand out there the 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 massive gap between Jamar Chase and T. Higgins in terms of involvement in the offense and actual talent. T. Higgins, eighteen percent target share. Jamar Chase is almost thirty percent. Red zone targets, twelve for T. Higgins. Jamar Chase had twenty six despite being injured. Okay? That twenty six turned into how many red zone touchdowns? Five. For Higgins, it was four in 12. So there's opportunity on those red zone targets. We talked about DK Metcalf. It would be kind of wrong to say that his touchdown upside is there. And then you look at those red zone targets for Jamar Chase and don't say that he could put up he could put up 18 touchdowns. Like yeah. That's oh, in Jamar it, Chase's range of outcomes. He had nine last year. It would be very easy for him to put up 12 to 18. DJ Moore has uh, started playing in the NFL in 2018. Jamar Chase has more career touchdowns than DJ Moore. Pour one out for DJ. Yeah, that's that's just yeah. But um, yeah, he's he's well worth consideration. Like Jefferson, who we're about to talk about, Hill, Cup, Chase, which Adams to be to, all could be number one this year. All yes, could finish number one. And worth it's at least worth mentioning for for Jamar Chase. Again, if you're just tuning in, you may have missed it. Joe Burrow suffered a calf strain uh, last. Last week was mm-hmm. that when that happened. So Joe Burrow will basically be shut down 
until the season actually starts. We don't love a franchise quarterback having a calf strain for what on a calf. If you looked at the video, he already had a sleeve on that calf, so he was already he knew something was wrong with it. So that that is that can be a slight concern for if if you're out there and you want to completely avoid any risk with these top picks. Yeah, I, I don't worry at all about the lack of preseason or anything Agreed. like that. Yeah, yeah. That that doesn't scare me at all. It's just a matter of there is a chance Tweak of re-aggravation. One. Yeah, re-aggravation and, and Tweak week one. one. Tweak one would be bad. Yeah. I don't <laughs> want I don't. to see it. Uh, Justin Jefferson is number is one. That, is that Ms. Doubtfire? Oh, yeah, it is. Is that what that is? I don't yeah. think so. Yeah, that's Miss Doubtfire. No, no at least the voice. I don't. She's a higher voice, oh. dear. <laughs> she's up here. That's well. Is that's the, a, the pronunciation of the word "don't" yeah. though is what we're getting at. Mm. That's just Scottish to me. A don't, a don't, um, or is that Irish? I don't know. No, that's Scottish. Give me doubtfire again. I don't. <laughs> okay, thank you. Justin Jefferson is number one. Yeah, real bold <laughs> by us. <laughs> um, Look, I believe he's a good wide receiver i think he's <laughs> gonna be getting yards and targets in this offense okay. um he's uh good at catching the Wait, ball did you just say you believe he's gonna get yards and targets yeah yeah wow. and I, wow. like when i watch him yeah i see a wide receiver that i believe in and i think that <laughs> when he's on the field uh he's He's just really nice. Incredibly, Adam Thielen is vacating the second most routes in the NFL. Yeah. So, um, you know, Addison's a rookie, and uh, KJ Osborne is a is a wide receiver two and a half, and so uh, everything's guaranteed for Jefferson. He has the most targets through the any player's first three seasons of the NFL at 476. I don't think Madison's as good as Cook, especially in the passing game. Like, there's just nothing to stop Justin Jefferson this year. And so he is the safest pick. If you don't want to stress, just take him. Yeah, one hundred and one. It's it's his rookie year. He was the wide receiver six. Then he was the wide receiver four. Last year he was the wide receiver one with eighteen hundred and nine yards. He had Can't fewer touchdowns him. than he should have. Like he he has positive touchdown regression. He could be better than he was last 28 year. Twenty eight red zone targets and six red zone touchdowns. Yeah. And 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 um, this will be very surprising, but he's having a great camp. People are saying Jefferson, Je- oh, Justin man. Jefferson okay. is having a great camp. They're just saying he looks really good. Get that hype train going for Justin Jefferson. I mean, can I make him a my guy? Yeah, yeah you <laughs> sure can. Hey. That one I think is going to be a little tougher to. Yeah, you know, really justify. That but would be we a make fail, the rules. A, a my guy fail if he finished it too. Yeah. That's, You'd have to. The only way you could make him a my guy is if it's a ironclad guarantee that he's the number one. Yeah, it's it's tough for someone to be a my guy where like the what you have uh, eleven, ten out of twelve teams just simply won't ever even have the opportunity to draft him. No, I I um I guess I won't do it then. All right, that is it for today's episode of the podcast. Done with the wide receivers, the running back rankings countdown. Next week, we'll be with you every day. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.